in the last years I recognize that or yeah that this racing it's getting harder and harder for me and that I don't I'm not super hot on oh cool there's an next race and I can give everything and I want to be the first but okay I hate losing and I loved also this winning and that's all my motivation I have to why I'm competing on this level at the moment and why why I'm trying to be the first even because I hate this losing and with Jakob together it makes a lot of fun and Tokyo is just okay we have the chance to win these Olympic Games huh? so if we would say okay we want to compete there and maybe see the final or maybe win a medal so everybody would say hey, you're stupid so we won a lot of these races in the last years nearly everything so we are one, I think the biggest favorites there and we are also these guys who can lose the most Hello, I'm Axel, and this time I'm with Max Hoff. And uh, Max, tell me, who are you? Hello. Um, yes, I'm Max Hoff. I'm a German kayaker. I'm 30 years old, right now living in Essen. That's uh, in the Ruhrgebiet, Western Germany. Um, I'm doing this kind of sprint for a couple of years now and um, competing in Tokyo in a couple of weeks. My fourth Olympic Games in the K2, 2000, uh, 1000 meter, was together with Jakob Schopp. And in the past years, I did this job on, in the, on the water quite really good. Got um, won this Olympic gold medal in Rio and some world championship titles and Europeans and also a medal in the K1 in London 2012. And yeah, that's what I'm doing. I studied, studied some economics and biology and have two master degrees. And I'm living here. My girlfriend and future wife right now living in Berlin because she's a rower and she has to, to row there and she's just step into the plane today, fly over to Tokyo. And um, yeah, that's what we are doing. It seems like it's been like for, for a few, few weeks or months <laughs> as it is a far, as far as it is from the Olympics. Tell me, uh, you know, your first memories, how far you remember your career? Maybe do you remember your first practice or first month of practice, how it was? <laughs> sure, even that I remember. Yeah. Um, I started hiking in 1994 and I was 10 years old. So it's quite... 26 years ago, 27 years now. And um, it was in Zipuk, it's a city close to Cologne. And, and my aunt asked me if I want to join this group of kids. And I went there in the afternoon with my mom and she brought me down. And I got this, uh, I got a racing kayak, but it was a down river racing kayak where I shoot down some rivers and not on a, on a, on a quite a flat lake. And um, there was, um, I don't know, 20 meters away from the, um, Pontong, where we entered the boat, there was uh, this grass of uh, this grass ball, which which come from fields and which you you which the um, farmers take to make food for the cows. I don't know how it's called in English, but there was something in the water, and I my my job was to paddle around it, and I couldn't do it, and I was always capsizing. So, <laughs> and in the evening we we drove home, and my mom said, "Okay, I will bring him never back." to this club you don't want to do this again but then from from then on i was i wanted to go there every day and i went to training every day and since i'm paddling and also my first competition was i don't know six weeks later but i didn't make it to the finish because i capsized and um, so that, that is, this is my first um, experience of kayaking and racing and then yeah, after that i don't really remember <laughs> which would have been the important steps. I only know that I got junior world champion in 2000 in down river racing. It was the first major big um, title. And then, yeah, I, I got to the senior level and raced in a, quite a lot of World Cups. And I won my first World Cup medal in 2004, I know. Now I got third and got world champion in this down river racing in 2006. So this was a main big, as a first big, title and even after this title in 2006 i decided to because it was all in down river racing and this is a sport which is which is not olympic or it's not an olympic discipline olympic discipline is only this um, kind of sprint on the lake and this kind of slalom and um yeah then i had this dream of olympic games then i decided to buy a boat and uh, in the winter in 2006 to 7 i bought a racing kayak 
um, booked a flight, flew to South Africa, and then I trained there in the warmer area. And um, then in the April 2007, I raced the German trials, and um, I got second and first on 1,000 meter. And then this head coach of Germany came to me and asked me, hey, who are you? I don't know you. I don't know from where are you, from where do you come, what are you doing? And I was a little bit paddling in a different style, really high frequency, but I was fast enough. And then he invited me to race some World Cups. I was racing there, I made it into the team, raced the World Championships. Duisburg 2007 got 10s and didn't make it to the direct qualification for Tokyo, but one year later, 2008, I, I won a bronze medal. Uh, this was my first at the European Games in the K1 1000 meter, and this was my first medal in sprint racing 2008 at the Olympic, yeah, at the European Championships in, in my land, Milan. And then I raced in Beijing, got fifths. I was happy with that well, personally. Uh, in Germany, it was the place number five. You're not really good. So, but, but I was the f- fastest guy in 2008. But I had to race this um, K1, and the other guys um, raced K4 and K2, and even the K4 got third, and the K2 got Olympic champion. But even for me, it was nice. And but then I, yeah, I wanted more. And um, then the really, really f- big first thing came in 2009, and where I won, I think every thousand meter race, and also the world title in the K1 thousand meter in Canada in Halifax. Yeah, and it was the first thing where I really recognized that I reached top level of the world. And yes, afterwards, yeah, it was, I won a lot of these races and defend the title in 2011 and in 2010 and 11, I won also two, two titles, but not in the K1000 because that was the main focus on qualifying the K4. And I know that I, we had the heat and the semifinal of the K4 just two hours before the K1000 meter final, where I finished, I think, fourth. But it I did, it didn't matter for me. And yeah, and then full focus on London. And I think in London, <clears throat> after a couple of years, I had the best performance of my life, but I didn't manage in my head. And um, I regards Larsen did a really good race and even Adam, but I was starting and doing really bad first 300 meters, which I could much better and did better in training. Yeah, but that, that's a game, and um, I know that we have been in the, the first race on this day, and they, on the right and left lane of the start line, they put some big music boxes, mm-hmm. and in the final, when we went into the start shoes, they put on these speakers and made this, woof, woof, this hard stroke, and it was so loud that these start shoes were vibrating in the water. So you could see the small waves and wow. you could feel all this noise in your body. And I was I was really fine and calm before the start, but then I was just 10 seconds before totally nervous because I didn't knew that this will happen. And yeah, that was the thing where I needed too much time in the race to get into it. And then yeah, I had not the self-confidence during the race to put down the best race of my life and but at the end I was third and I was happy and even this first Olympic medal was a really great experience and I'm very thankful for this and then it went on to Rio where I had a really bad K1 was collecting some weeds after 100 meters and um, even in our race there had been some other guys who had these problems like Peter Geller and Danny Olsen and also, Pimenta said at the end, but I don't really know. And um, yeah, but then was totally disappointed because I was training for this race. And I think, okay, the chance to win was not that big like in London, but I had the chance to win a medal. And even if you are in a race like this, you want to fight for and you want to do your best race. And if you are stopped by some weeds and grass and big leaves, it wasn't that nice. But two days later, we raced this incredible K4 race. and. Yeah, this was, I think, one, uh, it was until now the biggest achievement in, in my career. Even it was, in a, it was in a team boat, so it's different to these K1 races. But the style, like we did it there, and with this, yeah, how we did it, it was something special. And this happened, didn't happen a lot before, or other crews did it in that way. And that was really, really cool with these guys. And 
since then. I now I told a lot, huh? since then I'm doing all this, this stuff in the K2, which I'm raising. Um, first with Marcus Gross, who got injured and isn't feeling, or he's still a little bit injured and not really healthy, but yeah, he will get back to it. And since 2019, I'm racing with Jakob, who's really young, and it makes a lot of fun, and it's really successful. So we are a good team here in Germany, and really professional working on it. And now we try to do a good job in four weeks. Huh? Right, right. And uh, a, uh, a very colorful and, 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 and lengthy career, I would say, for you. And how would you feel like has the sport changed because like there are some changes ahead of uh, you know for the olympics as well because uh next olympics will have a different program for you but throughout the years in your experience how you feel you and the sport has changed in your experiences for sure the sport i changed a lot in the last years and even like i think in beijing or london it was the last time that we had the old olympic program or even no more it was in beijing and then they changed always the program and there's not a really consistent program in the sport and that for me i think or even when i look to the young guys it's really really hard because then in london they started with 200 meters and then the young guys started to prepare for this and it's not what you do in one or two years and now it's the last time that they're racing it and it's out again so you don't need these guys anymore so now you're switching to 500 so it's a compromise for probably shorter and these longer guys but i think now it's time that you get some consistency in these disciplines which they are racing that you get young guys to the sport and we see here even in germany that it's really hard for us to get these young people to the sport even because our school system changed a little bit there's so not so much time for these kids anymore to to um to train so i think there are big problems and even i know that the ioc wants some sports with it which is more spectacular and which is maybe more interesting in videos and where you get which is more connected to this yaoske generation but i think in this traditional sport you should keep some consistency consistency that you get these young guys and get young people into the sport i think it's fine now which i which um is good at that we have now the same amount of boys and girls in the sport because i think that state of the art you can't have maybe eight disciplines for boys and four for girls so now it's six six that's fine and even in <coughs> kayak racing so if you look to the thousand meter, which is my more, or which is my discipline, um, it changes. I think then not then not not a lot change, but the style of racing is always changing. But this depends mostly on the guys who are leading in the world. So in the moment, these guys or in the years where I was, yeah, really successful, it, I, there were. Eric and Adam and maybe just before a little bit before was Tim Brabant and yeah, then it was me Kenny Wallace was there and some other guys uh, we did much more consistent races and I we were always racing really hard at the end so at least me and Eric and um, we did a really steady race and then the other guys like Paulson on Pimenta and now also Kopbash or Dosta they knew how to beat me or to beat us and so the races and the style changed that they start really, really fast. And at the end, they are not racing that speed anymore like the years before. But because they knew then when they give you four or five seconds at 500, even if this style of racing is a little bit, in my opinion, stupid, and um, then you, the other guys are like me, I, I, I don't believe in myself anymore. And that was maybe the way how they beat me in 2015 in the World Championships because they are Eric, no, not Eric, um, that Paulson, he raced, I think, the first 500 meter in 138 seconds, and then the th second 500 in 150, and um, so overall it was something like the 328. And when I was racing 328, I was doing 143 and then the 145. So really consistency, you know, same two same distances, and that is the style which changes changes always. Like you can see now in the K2, like Jakob and me. 
also with Margus, we were starting, we are starting really, we are starting fast, but not super fast, and then trying to get a high speed on the, on the course and always started our race after 500 meters. And now you can see that the guys from Slovakia, they start really fast and try to confuse us during the race because they get a big lead and then try to get to the finish in front of us that we don't believe in ourselves and our second half. And there are also some other guys who try to start at 500 and break us in our head. But until now, it works out what we are doing. And we have our race plans. And But that's always when you're in the front, you are the guy who, who is, who is um, hunted and the others try to copy your tactic or they try to beat you in certain ways. And even all this is a mental game and um, you can be physically very, very strong, but you have to be on point in that game with your head. And I think for a couple of years, you can be competitive in one discipline, but like maybe being in front in the K1 or the K2 for more than 10 years is nearly not possible. And even if you see this, all the guys who are competing more than 10 years get, are getting tired and everybody knows you and your strengths and your weakness. And um, you always compare yourself to your best races. And you also know a lot of races where it didn't work out very well. And I think you get a little bit too much uh, you try to think a bit too much about this, what you're doing. So it, it's important that you change a little bit your, 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 your focus and so change some disciplines and learn something new to do, 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 do something different. And the way our canoeing started changed. It's Was there a turning point for you when you decided to kind of pay more attention to these mind games and these tactics and like understanding the pace of the race because I, I presume that that wasn't for you the case all the time you know since, since from, from the beginning that you mean you told me just uh prior in the beginning was it all or maybe no, it wasn't all for you like that no in the beginning it wasn't that it was just that i wanted to race and trying to be as fast as possible but even with our coach and this system in germany we were always talking about these times and how fast you have to go with um with on on which, yeah, on which, um, and we normally we block this in these 250 meter parts, huh? first 250, then second 250 meter, then third and fourth 250. I always said we're four times 250 meters, this thousand meters. And we always were talking about how fast we have to go every 250 meter and what is the main goal, how to do this. But yeah, I think um, the longer you are in one discipline and racing one discipline, then you're analyzing more races and more and more races and you try to maybe change your racing tactic because everybody tries to copy you or know how you do, uh, how you work out. Um, and I think then after a couple of years, you start to think about that at the mental game because, and then it's getting to, that it, then it starts to be a mental game because when you're young and you didn't want anything, you have nothing to lose. You're just there and you want to beat everybody. So you're there and you're like a hunter. But even then, if you want to defend something and if you, when you're on the top and to stay there, that's the most challenging part. It's not that hard to be or to get world champion the first time. It, okay, it's hard, but the second and third time or that what's happened now, it's much more challenging because you know on the start line that okay the only thing that you don't get worse than the last time is you have to win and if you don't win then some people or yourself are disappointed because you know that you have done it better but even this is a stupid thinking because it's such a privilege if you race in the final from the Olympic Games and maybe if you just win a medal that's something super special and it's not usual and that's what you always have to yeah, bring back into your mind that even that what you're doing and where you are even if you win this gold medal or a medal is something which quite only a few people can do and there are so much young athletes which yeah, 
which look up to you and want to do this. Yeah, because you mentioned that that was like your first big win, right? The junior championships was your big uh, first big win. Can you name yeah. a win that you maybe is your favorite win? The favorite win is for sure this race. Yeah, I have some good, really good races where I look up to what I did there and where how or the style how I performed. For sure, this is this race in 2011 at the European Championships where I raced this world record in, in Belgrade. And the style that I was racing the second two and 500 meters much faster than the first ones. And also, but also my first, the first title I did in 2009 and winning the world championships. Even there, I was racing down and said, I can be, be, be quiet. And I knew that Adam van Kuppen was leading the field uh, maybe by two lengths at 500. And I was just by myself and said, okay, what you can do in the first 500, I will catch you at the end and I'm, I will be much faster than you. And also the style, how I raced there and getting the last, uh, getting down the race the last 350 meters was really good way. And this is, this are really good races. And, but then this race in Beijing in the K4 was not in Beijing in, in Rio was crazy. And also the style, how I was racing with Jacob in, Saget in the K2 uh, is one of the biggest races we did, huh? or I did. But I was doing, watching a lot of videos since the last time how I was racing, and there have been quite a lot of races in at World Cups, which I didn't remember to, where I didn't remember to. Like 2015 in Duisburg, I did a really, really good job, and I think afterwards one of my best races. But I didn't could not remember to this race, but I was watching it afterwards. And so it's so much, but yeah, this world champion champs in 2009 to 211 K1 at Europeans, Rio and 2019 in Saget, that was quite some special races. That, that's why I think it's interesting because you know, of so many races and uh, trainings and everything, maybe it, it gets, gets like a blur. That's why you had already admitted that you don't remember some races in that kind of sense. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, tell me, like, because it's a very interesting thing as well. You met, uh, you have the gold medal in uh, the K4 from the Olympics. And it's interesting for the kayaking sport. It's both a team sport and an individual sport, right? So how is it for you? How do you kind of compare it? And what, what is the feel like, you know, the differences between the both and how you uh, approach it? So, <laughs> yeah, it's both. So. Even when we raced, or when I was only racing the K1, we were in in the training. We were we have been a team sport, so we were always training together and uh, competing in the training, fighting against each other and fighting with together. And um, always in the single boats, I wasn't sitting that much in team boats for for, for practicing. But and now it changed a little bit, so now it's definitely also in training a, a team sport we, because we train a lot in the single boats and in the team boats and try to get the best mixture, do all this um, endurance stuff in the K1 and the speed stuff more in the team boats. But in racing, it's so mentally the K1 is the most um, it's the most um, difficult or hardest discipline because even after a couple of years because you're on the race by your own and you have nobody who supports you if you're on a team board and maybe you're not sitting in front you can say okay i'm just doing what the guys in front of me is doing and i'm doing my best and i'm going all out and i'm not responsible for this board if like now when i'm sitting in the k2 in front i'm also responsible for the tactic it's before it was a little bit more Marcus behind me who, he, who was giving the commandos and was saying what I have to do. But in 2019, when Jacob came into the boat, he had to learn quite a lot. And I was, yeah, I, I took over the commander and said, okay, we have to race this style and we're doing this style. And he is only the guys. So he's an incredible talented paddler and super fast. So he can support me really good in that what we are doing and now we're a really, really good team and yeah the winning is different so in the k1 it's absolutely if you win in this k1 you know you have done it by your own and that's something which is super special but if you're doing it in a team boat it's also quite nice because you have done it with some of your friends with which you are sweating so much in training and living together for so much weeks and we are sleeping in one room for more and a half year for more than a half year per year 
So it's super cool because then you're happy. I know in 2009, I was, I got world championship. I won the world champs in the K1 and our team boats didn't have not been really good. So they have all been very disappointed. And I was the only guy, guy who, who won in the thousand meter discipline in the medal and my training group, I was totally happy. And then I said, Oh, I can't, it's not, I can't be so happy because they are so all disappointed. And so it was a little bit stupid because I wanted to be happy, but I said, yeah, I have to be quiet and careful. And that was stupid. But, but and if you are together in a team boat, then you're happy together or you're disappointed together and you can support you. So that it is. And even in a race, I think in a team boat, when and it's normal that in every race in between you have maybe two or three or four strokes where you think about okay, shall I give up or let's just let's go where you are on your limit and you think that's all you can do when you can't go any faster. And that's where you need a rest in the race. And when you're in a team boat, then you realize that if you just do one stroke a little bit, well. Yeah, with less power, then you feel the partner and then you have, you're responsible also for him. So you give in the next stroke, you're back in, in the game and you give everything because yeah, then you're not doing it for your own, you're doing it for him. And maybe you can, so that's in, right now, I'm tired of racing in a K1 because for myself, I'm not, I don't feel responsible for myself anymore. So if I win a K1 or not, I don't care. I've done so much good races and I have so much success that I'm absolutely happy with this performance as I did. But when I race in a K2 and I get these feelings in the race, I think, no, stop, you have to go. It's just for Jakob and it's for your partner. You don't have to give up, give everything. And then I can go much more to my limit in a team boat, then I can do it in a K1 at the moment. But it's fine, and that's the way, way how, why I'm racing these team boats. And that this is yeah, the challenge where it's the team sports, and you start in a race, start to have the feeling that you are responsible for someone else and not for you. And then uh, sometimes you give more than you would do for yourself or when normally you would give up you don't do it yeah the, i don't know how to say, explain yeah would you say that the no. winning in k1 feels a, a bit lonely in a way and you can share the wins in team boats yeah uh, definitely that's the way sometimes it can be cool to win it lonely and it's just for you and it's totally intensive and an intensive feeling but yeah, in a team boat, that's yeah. I just said one the way how you you said it, right? Definitely, all right? Well, well, in, in perspective, like as winning at all, like uh, can you even describe the feeling of winning, like in general? Maybe not separated between the boat classes, but uh, winning in general. Uh, how does it feel? Winning, yeah, it's a really cool feeling. So. I think, yeah, even if you win something the first time, then you are super happy and you have so much happy feelings inside. And it, it's the return of the, all, all this invest you put into the sport and all these long periods where you were training and it felt so much pain. And yeah, woke up every morning really, really early, got out and all this even sport it's not always fun eh? so your body is always at the limit and you have a lot of physical problems and so winning is some it's this special thing at uh, this moment where all this pays off and this feeling when you go over this finish line as the first guy or when you win a medal it's just you're absolutely happy with yourself and no one else so it's just for you you're fine with yourself and all the surroundings and you're at yeah, peace. winning. <laughs> yeah, you're in peace with, with yourself. And that's, uh, for me, it's that I'm in peace with myself. And that's the most important thing. And that that's also the, all the motivation why I'm doing it now, because I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it for anybody else or I'm not 
okay, our sport is not that I earn here a lot of money and, and I'm just living right now. I'm living fine, but it's a not, not like playing soccer or being a pro, pro golfer or something or tennis player. So why I'm doing it is that I'm in peace with that, what I've done and what I have achieved. And these feelings and this, this feeling just after the finish line, I think after Rio or sometimes when you win this world championship or an Olympic, but even this Olympic Games title, it was much more than everything else. It's, I can think then maybe when you marry or when you get a child, then maybe it's a feeling which is maybe a little bit better and where you feel maybe more happiness, but it's close to that. And it's hard in the normal life to find anything which yeah puts so much pleasure and happiness and yeah all this mixture and cocktail of hormones in your body <laughs> what this moment can do when you cross the finish line well well you talk about the olympics and now the focus is uh, to that uh, race right but uh, this time when we are recording this interview it's kind of um, the quiet period before the storm right it's it's uh, right you have qualified you know and now just a couple of uh, weeks uh, you, you know waiting for the olympics what do the olympics mean for you because you've been to three olympics already um, can you describe the feeling of olympics and what do the olympics mean for you in the last years the olympics mean uh... I would not say the world for me, but it's this why I'm doing this sport. And it was always my biggest motivation and my dream, which I had since a little child. And it's when the, all this family comes together and it's, it's just the biggest thing you can achieve in sports. And it's, it's being really on the top of the world and there is nothing which can be better. So for sure, if you're putting so much energy into training and all this, and then you achieve this or you, you, qualify for the Olympic Games and then you achieve a really good result. It, it means a lot to you. And even this after the Olympics, it's sometimes really hard and a lot of hard and a lot of athletes have these post-Olympic depressions, um, depressions because um, they were only focused on this, on this event and, they, and everything in, the life, in their lives they put aside, even when it's sometimes family lives parties, friends, and it's just, you're just focused on this. And so sometimes afterwards, it's really hard to get back to this motivation for just getting back into the normal life and getting back to training and also to find some other things where you're interested in. But now, After the three Olympics, I was I had the dream to compete one Olympic more, and I wanted to see what I can achieve in this in this age. And I like kayaking so much. So the moment it's more that I just like this sport, and I, I love it to be on the water, to have the feeling that I'm free outside there on the lakes, and that I can move my body, and that I'm in a healthy condition. And that's what I enjoy every day, and even. In the last years, I recognized that, or yeah, that this racing it's getting harder and harder for me, and that I don't, I'm not super hot on. Oh, cool! There's the next race, and I can give everything, and I want to be the first. But okay, I hate losing, and I loved also this winning, and that's all my motivation I have to why I'm competing on this level at the moment, and why why I'm trying to be the first even because I hate this losing and with Jakob together it makes a lot of fun and Tokyo is just okay we have the chance to win these Olympic Games huh? so if we would say okay we want to compete there and maybe see the final or maybe win a medal so everybody would say you're stupid so we won a lot of these races in the last years nearly everything so we are I think the biggest favorites there and we are also these guys who can lose the most from all athletes who will start there. Yeah, but, but it's a big privilege to 
to have the chance to start at the Olympic Games and now to say again, okay, we have the chance to win. And even for me, with an age of 38 years, to have a really good chance to win the Olympic Games, it's something which is really special. And even for me, my girlfriend, she qualified this time also for the Olympic Games. So we're hitting that together. And that's also really fine. But she's a rower. So due to Corona, we don't see us because she has to leave Tokyo before I arrive. <laughs> it's a little bit sad. And before it was cool because I thought, okay, maybe she can sit on the Tribune and she's ready and can enjoy the last week of the Games and being a tourist. Um, yeah, but it means a lot. And even Tokyo for me is, uh, I think, one of the last big sentences, sentences in this big chapter of canoeing, canoe racing, professional canoe racing. Yeah? I don't know what's going on afterwards, but even with changing the disciplines in Paris to shorter distances, this will for sure not be... I think I will be there in Paris, but maybe not as an athlete. <laughs> for sure not as an athlete. I'll be there as a, I don't know, coach, spectator or whatever. And Tokyo is a good close-up for all this. Right. For me. We sp spoke about, about this prior to the interview, uh, but how was this extra year for you? Can you explain uh, more about it? Like, did it help you yeah. or did it kind of threw you off? It didn't help. It helped me out. So I'm in this age where uh, your year longer makes it a little bit more harder. So it wasn't that hard when they canceled the Olympic Games that I knew to myself, okay, now you have to train one more year. Mm, I was fine with this because I like the sport and I like to train and I really go to training. I, okay, I don't like it to train every day, but I go to training and I do it because I like it and not because I have to train. But even I had the offering of a job and all this... I do, couldn't take this job, so I'm just one more year this professional athlete and my plans have been a little bit different. So this was a little bit challenging to manage it, but yeah, I, I, I took the decision that I just want to go to Tokyo with all risks. But um, this year in spring, I was struggling a little bit in the, in, in the K1 at the, our national trials and just made it to the team, not really good. And that was the first time in all this year they, that I was performing not really good. All these years before, I was just first race and I was through disqualification. And um, yeah, I feel in the moment that every year I'm racing longer to peak on this highest level at this exact point, it's not getting easier. So I'm getting used and I'm also I'm used to all this training and I can do maybe if you race in a K1, three, you have to race three minutes and 30 seconds. I'm fine to do this. But then to do one time this 325 is just five seconds. Some years ago, it had been much easier for me. So now this is hard and yeah, for sure. I had a lot of, I had a lot of thinkings last year if I can manage it this year because even because in the German team, there are some good guys which are coming up. And um, maybe I teach a lot of the guys in the last years how they have to train to get faster. And I think I was one of the biggest motivators in our team. But now <laughs> they caught me. And for me, it's hard to say, okay, you have to wait one more year. And then you can have all these what I, I, I had. Right. Um, well, no. but tell me why the German team is always so competitive and so good. You know, not only even in this sport, but in many other sports. But but specifically, if we look at the future, and if you turn into the coaching positions, we will point at you. But that's the reason why the team is so good. But, but right now, why the team has been so good? Okay, I, I cannot say everything, but <laughs> even I don't know. But I think we have really good coaches, and we have a really good training structure, and we have um, a lot of training centers in Germany where most of the good athletes train and it's not that we have this one training center we have around eight and so you can choose which is maybe in your area and then we have a good um, style or good rhythm of um, training camps and being at home mostly three weeks away two weeks at home and three weeks somewhere else and sometimes the period at home is also a little bit longer and then we have a really really good big data of all this training we have done and we record nearly everything 
what we have done, our heart rates, stroke rates, power, what we are doing in the gym. We have a lot of tests during the season and even in the World Cup season and during races, we do this test at home. So we always know at every point we were where we are physically and we can compare all these data with all the last years and even with guys from maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago so with all these data and then i think our coaches have a really good education and way and read a lot of literature or which way you have to train then they have a lot of experience so all the new coaches we try to get we put into our younger classes that they get some experiences or first at clubs and then they get up and up to this higher level and um, then it's that we are doing it that all our guys are doing it like a professional job so we are on the water every day for a couple of times we don't miss this endurance training and so I think this is what really important in Germany we have We try to have a really high level throughout the whole year and then we peak for certain points. But our main level, which we have, so that we are maybe always able to race the 335 and that we have this high level of endurance and high level of gym, uh, performance in the gym, that we don't have to peak so much to get this top level. And even in the team boat, it works out really well. Maybe in the K1, if you want to race in the K1, it's sometimes not that easy. So in the last years for our boys, it, it worked out really well, well because we had always see some special crazy guys like me. And then afterwards we had Tom and Mike's ranch, but he's a little bit stupid and crazy. And also now Jakob. But for the main team, we have a really good base where we put maybe everybody to maybe 97% of To, to 97, 97, 97% level to the top of the world. So then at the end to peak out for this last 3%, which you need in the K1, maybe we are not the best ones or we need some special guys who can do this, but we have this high big level nearly in every athlete that we can compete on this level in these team boards because they always know, okay, everybody nearly can do it in this way and we can change all the guys. And so if someone ill, we can put in someone else. And I think it's the experience of the coach, all the data we have, this training structure, this training areas and that our coaches we try to uh, think of making too much holiday get up get us back to the training and even in the moment we have so much in the men's discipline at least we have so much young guys which are doing so much pressure on on the older ones um, because they all want to get into the team that we have to perform on this high level so sometimes it's harder to qualify for the German team than winning a world cup or something like yeah this. yeah but well it's a, a big quality of pool of athletes i would say but you mentioned that maybe you may be a coach uh, you might be a coach uh, in the next olympics or you already have uh plans and you have a degree in biology and economics tell me what's the future for you like why biology and economics it's some, somewhat uh the opposite spectrum <laughs> yeah for sure But I, when I started studying, I didn't thought about being a coach. So even now I'm trying in the next time I, I want to learn something else. So I, I said, oh, and, and at some point when I say, okay, it's, I'm done with kayak racing on a professional level. I do it now for, for fun. Um, I would like to learn something else or something else in our life or what, what, what's possible to do and where, where can work in our life. But biology was... I was always interested in the subjects and what you're doing. I was doing most of stuff like biochemistry and genetics. And afterwards, if you're a scientist, you normally uh, you would have to do your PhD, but I was, I didn't want it to be always a, a specifically scientist because this was too much, too much in detail for me. I was always thinking about maybe getting to a big company and coordinate some bigger projects and yeah, to, 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 more different stuff and 
I was just kayaking for quite a couple of more years. I finished my master in 2010, I think, in biology. And I said, okay, what can I do else? And then it was this way to do an MBA. And I did this besides the sport. And now for sure I will, I worked out in a nutritional company. I, I'm trying to get back into this um, business and developing food and um, yeah, trying to get people to a healthier lifestyle and maybe to um, get into the mind of everybody what healthy food that your body is your capital huh? and that you if you that what you put in that is very important to that how you feel and what you get out of it and I would be happy if the people would think a little bit more about their nutrition and a healthier lifestyle and when I could do this in the, in the industry or trying to get the food which is in our supermarkets a little bit more healthier and that the people think a little bit more about the ingredients and that the ingredients which are inside. For sure I will stay in the, in the sport and I will teach younger athletes and to get better but I don't know if I do it now directly or when I stop as a professional coach but maybe later on I would not say no or I never say no that I will be maybe work one day as a coach like Andreas Dittmar the, who is a coach from our canoe guys he stopped after Beijing and then he was 10 years working in a, at the big German bank for marketing and sports marketing and now he's also back in coaching but I think sometimes it's important to to get some other experiences and even you need to get some distance to all the athletes which with which you competed together as well. Eh? So now getting into the team and being a coach when you have been an athlete, maybe one year before, then I think sometimes a little bit difficult even to get the respect from the younger athletes. So there's some some more rest in between. But how, how difficult for you it was to combine the studies and sport because it takes time to get a high level it was, at both. It was difficult. Even the studying of biology, I did the main part of this I did when I was doing this down over racing. And then I, was, I wasn't in that much training camps like I was afterwards in sprint racing. And, but then my days often started in the morning at five and I went to training, then to university, back to training, university, back to training, came back home maybe at eight in the evening. And then I went to do something for university and the days have been long sometimes. And there have been a couple of times where I put my, um, my bell in the morning to wake up, not beside the bed to, or I put it somewhere else in, the, in my flat, but I had to go up and I had to go to training and I tried to like always get someone else to the club that I'm not there alone and that I knew I have to go there because if I'm not going, then they are waiting. But it was hard. And even in the winter, not in the, I, I always tried to do not much studying when I was in the racing season, but in the winter I had long days and I was quite a few times very, very tired. But then it is that you, yeah, you have, you, when you want to do it, then you can do it. Huh? And it's just the time in between. Okay, you don't lie on the couch and watch some TV or watch some stupid stuff and useless stuff in the internet. It's just you have to work and you don't have to ask yourself why you're doing it. You just have to do it. That's the most important thing, I think. And these other, this economic studying of economics, I was doing in a university where I had not to go. I just, it was just online. And that was much easier, but I didn't know anybody at this university. So I was, I had always to motivate myself by my own. And I did not work together with some other students. So it was really boring, but I paid some money for it and motivation. And normally when I start something to do it and I said, okay, I want to do this and I want to finish it, then, I, then I'm doing it. And I don't ask myself in between why are you doing it and is it, is it it worse? No, I just finish it. And then afterwards I can think about it, if it was right or not. And at the way, but yeah, it's, you start up, you start very early and your day is a little bit longer than normal. So it's not a 40 hour week. 
um, doing sports and studying. So it's more seven day week with a lot of hours working. Right. Right. Well, I have a kind of quick round of questions for you. Uh, combining everything together, sports, academical life, life together, right? Uh, answer these questions, please, to me. What would you call your biggest achievement? My biggest achievement? <laughs> I think it's getting this... Degrees in, at universities together with this sport, so it's both together. I could say, okay, my biggest achievement is my Olympic title, but I think in a way, your lifestyle, you more, could say, right, that you've been able to make. I think it's a little bit more. It's this lifestyle and being the guy who I am, and just really grounded, and. I don't feel really special and that I have just normal friends and that I'm going and just, I think this sport and all this success didn't change me personally. So I'm just the same guy like all my friends who just have a normal job or something else. And, and the biggest achievement, I don't know, the girl beside me. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say uh, is your greatest teacher? It could be both a person that has been in your life or maybe an event that uh, kind of changed your uh, view of life? A teacher I had quite a lot. I think in one way, now it had been my mom and she died on cancer when I was 20. And afterwards she wasn't there as a person, but she was a teacher above the clouds where I, rem I was thinking really often about her and how she would have handled in these situations. And this was really often that what influenced me the most, what, how I was preparing myself for the next steps and how I was dealing and handling with other people because I was always thinking about how she would have done it. That's the way, but she wasn't this guy or coach who was, who was beside me all the time. Huh? She, she's, she passed away 20 years ago. So, but she still has the most influence on myself. Right. That's um, both like a, as well as experience, I would assume for you as well, right? That kind of, kind of inspired you in a way, I presume, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, Since then, there are quite a lot of coaches and good friends who, yeah, but I took some information from everybody. And there's some guys who have a lifestyle in that way where I look up to, and the other guy is, or the other thing is something where I look up to. But, and I take a mixture from all of this, but mostly I try to. I try to be my own guy and I'm um, trying to live my own life. and. I don't try to copy anybody. Never I try to do this. I find, try to find my own way. Right. To beat someone <laughs> on, on the race track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, another thing, uh, what do you think is the most important thing um, in general in life? Being a friendly, fair, person be nice to your to the other people um, trying to stay healthy giving back a little bit of this what you got so if there's someone who needs some help then maybe be patient and be friendly and help and to show respect to everybody and I think it's not important in life For you as a person, you are not a good, a better person when you are Olympic champion suit to someone who may has an easy job. So this is makes you nothing better. It's the way how you deal with other people and how your behavior is and the respect you show to your environment. 
I think that's the most important thing in your in, in life. Huh? What do you think is the most important thing in your sport? The most important thing is the athlete, I think, but uh, between the paddle and boat, what do you think is more important? Boat and paddle. Yeah. So you need a mo for me personally, yeah, yeah, for sure, you need a fast boat. But the most important thing for me is my paddle because that's what I'm. So I can switch the boat from boat to boat. I just sit inside. Okay, I need some adjustment, but then I'm fine with it. But my paddle, okay, I can switch as well. But I think maybe to win Olympic Games, it's for me, it's more important to have the right paddle than my own boat. But even okay, the boat has to be competitive. Huh? You don't need, if you get an old boat which is, uh, has a really shitty surface and is really heavy, then you don't win a medal as well. But if I get a paddle which is totally different, then I'm not able to perform on this high level physically. I can do it in another boat. I need the right pedal. Oh. Right. Well, uh, tell me, if you could time travel and go back to the future, maybe visit yourself or to any other time, where would you go and what would you do? What I would do in the future, I would travel the world for sure. I will have a house somewhere on a cool lake, maybe on the ocean and um, living there being out on the on the water with my surf ski sailing boat and I don't know enjoying my life um, having good time with my friends and family and um, maybe giving back to some other guys and girls in the sport what I got and to give them happiness and Yeah, where am I as, as, as in, I don't think about where I am as a worker or where I will work as a guy and to make the environment around myself or to give the environment around myself something back yeah, without having a profit by myself. And I'm somewhere on the ocean and then having, having a good environment around myself and nice people and trying to help them to be happy have a conversation just in general about anything who would you choose and what would you talk about that in sports i would like to for sure um, talk with michael phelps and because in the media he is described as this crazy guy who trains so much and all that he never take a rest and all this and i would like sometimes i just think this is a little bit bullshit um on a budget but um I would really know, would really like to know what the real truth is behind what he did in training and how much it was and what he did to achieve. And if now he handed it with his ups and downs. And if I would like to speak to a guy outside sport, maybe Nelson Mandela. It's a good guy. And I think he had, he fought for really, really important things. And that's something, or he fought for something which is maybe even now is really in the focus of that all the people are equal and that it doesn't mind, or it doesn't matter on which color you have or which religion or what you are thinking or what, yeah who you love, if you're a transgender or not, then you started this movement. And for me, you have to respect everybody. And it doesn't matter on what, where he came from, where he, to, on what he thinks. So you have to be smart. Yeah? <laughs> if he's a run, he's really radical and yeah, not being smart to anybody else, then it's not nice, but Oh, that's maybe one guy. All right. All Because right. he fight for something which he fight it for something which should be um, usual or which, which for what you should not have to fight for. It, eh? it should be just normal that all everybody is equal, and there should be no difference. If there would be a message that you could send to everybody and uh, like kind of well wishes to everyone, what would it be? I would say everybody should think about or should believe in, in, in yourself 
and that everybody should start dream, start to dream, and at for, and for sure, if you have some dreams, you sh should start work and fight for it to achieve it. And even maybe if you want to have a better and happier life, then you have to go out. You should not sit on your couch at home and think about what you could do and how your life could be better. You have to go out and do something and then you make some experiences and then maybe you find the ways how it could get better. And now that's the way. Don't stop dreaming, but go outside and do something. And don't be too long at home and dream because <laughs> you will not reach your dream. All right. All right. Well, um, I say thank you about those words and I'd say thank you for your time about this interview and I wish you all the best. Uh, conquer your Olympic yeah, goals. So right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. thanks. All it was right. a pleasure for me. Thank you for watching this interview till the end. I really appreciate you taking the time and get to know Max Hoff way better. He's one of the legends in the sport, having titles all over the place in K1, K2, K4, Olympic gold medal, world championship title, European championship titles, and so many years in the sport. And now he's approaching the Olympics. Uh, right now, as I post this interview and re-recorded this interview prior to the Olympics, I hope he has his success and I wish you success as well. And I suggest you listen to other interviews that are on my channel to get inspired, get to know other people. And I wish you all the best. See you in other interviews.